I'm Ellie Blackburn. And I'm Bonnie Too Good. And this is Off the Leash. Proudly brought to you by the Pancake Parlour. Lovely. So three, Bonnie. We're we're back for episode three of, of Off the Leash Podcast. Um, new year. New year. Happy New Year. Happy 2022. New year. Same us though. Same us though. Not much has changed in that space. I can't can't believe we've made it to a new year. How was how was the Christmas break and the New Year celebrations? Oh, Christmas was wonderful. Spending time with the family. I'm always very grateful to be able to do that. How yep. about yours? Yeah, same. Love spending time with the family. And how's um, little Riley? Oh, my little nephew. He's um he's great. He was he was spoiled by Santa and mm. by everyone else around him. So he loved it. Like we had a there was a, a tracker, a Santa tracker that we were <laughs> following and he was checking in to see how many presents Santa had delivered to all the kids around the world and he was pumped. So it was a really exciting time for, for us. But we're here again thanks to the Pancake Parlour. Lovely. Yes, we're back again and they're great. Um, and we've had some pancakes over the weekend as well. They we were great. did. Well, we actually, like in preparation for this episode, we you know made a batch of pancakes and by yours truly, the master flipper herself, um, yep. <laughs> had, gave it a whirl and you were telling me about all the science behind it and yep. you can't see too much of the batter when you flip it and all of this. I was pretty impressed. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And um, yeah, I hope the pancake parlor are impressed with my efforts <laughs> as well with it as well. Um, but we'll move on because, um, Bonnie, you've got an introduction that, look, I'll be honest, I think it's too short for the person that we have on um, today and... I, I feel like we could just give an introduction that would last the entire episode, but I'll leave it to you and um, give this one a whirl. It was a hard one. I couldn't cut it down anymore. I sent it to you being like, do I need to cut it down? Because it's going to be too long, but I just have to keep everything in here and there's more. So just remember that, everyone. So we have a prestigious guest. I'm going to start with that. You could say uh, women's football royalty. Ooh, yes. Thank you. Yes. This incredible woman started her football career at the Fairfield Football Club and played 111 games in the VWFL. In 1989, she won the league's best and fairest award, the Helen Lambert Medal. From 1992 to 1997, she represented Victoria twice as captain and played in five premierships. She was the captain at the Scorpions and at Darabin Falcons when they won their grand finals. Boo so- Darabin, though. Yeah, you're an M- Melbourne Uni Melbourne, girl. Yeah, yeah. I have such a rivalry I've heard. <laughs> um, when she finished playing, she began her incredible coaching career, uh, started in 1997 um, and coached the Vic representative teams from 2001 to 2004. So <sighs> incredible. Incredible times there. Coached Darabin and Melbourne And Uni. then found her way. Yes, yes. A bit conflicting there. Muggum. <laughs> Muggum. <laughs> <laughs> Won premierships for both. Yep. Which is Again, taking incredible, taking the teams to ultimate success. Incredible. Uh, but wait, it doesn't stop there. No. The ultimate multitasker. During all of this, she had two stints at VWFL president for the year 1989 and then from 1997 to 2000. She is currently a member of the VFLW advisory board with AFL Victoria. Yeah, although that stopped. Okay. Well, that stopped a few years ago, but I was you were. one well, you of were. the inaugural members. Yes. Amazing. Wonderful. And then, not to mention her role with Victorian Police Force for nearly 39 years on LinkedIn. It was 38 and nine months, so we're nearly there. (laughs) She's held roles as Inspector, Commander, Superintendent, Acting Assistant Commissioner for Gender Equality and Inclusion, Chief of Staff to the Chief Commissioner (coughs) of Police, to a current role in in the Community Division. She was also inducted in the Victorian Police Sporting Hall of Fame in 2017. That's incredible. And it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. Let's round it back to the footy. Yep. For all that she's done for women's football, her legacies include the Lisa Hardiman medal for best on ground in the VFLW grand final mm. and yes. the Hampson Hardiman Cup yes. for the match between the OG teams, Western Bulldogs and Melbourne, which is what we're eyeing off this Saturday this night. Saturday night. So Pumped. we have Lisa, Lisa Hardiman. Woo! Thank you and thank you for the welcome. And just before we get into the conversation, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and thank our First Nations people for allowing us to walk and play on their lands. Thank you. Um, mate, incredible. Absolutely incredible. And 
I sort of speak on behalf of so many women, um, particularly in the footballing um, industry. Thank you for what you've done and for what you continue to do um, in this space. It's it's truly inspiring and um, I feel grateful to be in the presence of you right now, but to have gotten to know you over the last handful of years, especially um, here at the here at the kennel and, and you know, the role you played with us early on, like how how do you sort of process all of that? Like when you when you first hear that, I mean, how many times do you reflect on it? If you ever have, or just the words, all of it. Yeah, thank you, Ellie. Um, I've actually uh, been on a bit of a speaking tour at um, Victoria Police. I do a lot of um, talks to a variety of different groups of people where I go through my whole life story. Yep, nice. So, <laughs> um, and when I was originally writing it, it was like, oh gosh, you know, did I really do? all of that yeah um and so yeah I, I i do reflect on it regularly and um hearing it here today i'm sitting here going oh gosh you've done your homework girls <laughs> <laughs> and i mean it wasn't that hard to find and I, I feel like we know a lot of what you've done but we also uncovered some amazing things especially with your work in in the police force which we will touch on shortly but bon we we want to chat footy early yeah. don't we Take us back to the beginning of your footy career. Well, the beginning of my football career, uh, I did not know there was a women's league. Uh, I used to play state netball and uh, a friend of mine, Jane Searle. Uh, and I know Jane. She was my coach. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Okay, that's awesome. <laughs> um, and we were both in the police force together and she saw an ad in the newspaper. Uh, and I'm like, what do you mean there's a women's league? So we went along to training just to check it out. Um, and that was 1988, and um, I've had involvement ever since. Wow, that's incredible! Like, and look at you go! How amazing is that? Like Jane just playing two, football. Yeah, two yeah. Oh, she was very good. good. Oh yeah, yeah, fantastic. She, wow, uh, that's like that started the podcast on a great note because you, Jane said she was literally my netball coach. I found her very intimidating, but lovely lady. Yes, <laughs> she's a lovely lady. Um, she's a lovely yeah. lady. And what um, what drew you to footy? Like. Uh, Playing netball and and that, and then seeing an article. What why yep. football? Uh, when I uh, was born, uh, I had got two brothers and um, three cousins, all boys. So I'm the only girl. So growing up, I had a choice. So I could learn to play footy with my cousins and brothers. Uh, my grandfather used to play footy, so he taught us all, and he didn't discriminate against me because I was a girl. Yep. That created my love of football. Uh, I did follow my older brother to a local football team and started training. Uh, they applied for me to play, but because I was a girl, I wasn't allowed to. Wow. So I became the boundary umpire. Oh, yep, yep. Ran the boundary for a couple of years uh, and then got into into the netball scene and played you know, three state teams and um, state leg netball. For of course some, you did. Till I found football. <laughs> what was your position in netball? Uh, wing attack. Center. Mm, okay. Here if you need. Here, here if you need. need. I'm just <laughs> on, the, on, the, on the edge of the circle, just like here if you need. And then I was the goal attacker, like, it's okay. I've got this. I'll shoot I've it. got this. Um, you know, playing football and, um, you know, being a part of some successful teams. And um, obviously in Victoria, we're a proud footy state, especially in the women's footy ranks. Um, it was something sort of, you know, we wanted to win those national carnivals. Oh, and I, I feel like that started from an early day. Um, you know, what was what was those, comp those competitions like for you? Um, so uh, we started playing against South Australia. Uh, yep. We found out that they were playing, and I think it was about 1991 or two we started playing against them, and it was an alternating um, game. So one year we were over there. We caught um, trains, we caught buses, we stayed in cheap hotels because we couldn't afford to fly yep. in those days because we all, um, the league had no money. Yep. So any player that went had to self-fund. Um, and we never lost. Yes. Mm. I love that too. We never lost. True Victorian spirit there. I love that so much. Oh, well, there was there was a close game one year in South Australia and I was the captain and, and at three-quarter time after the coach had spoken to us, I said, we're not losing this. <laughs> and we didn't. Yeah, good. Good. Rightfully so. What is your most fond play, um, playing memory? My most fond playing memory? Um, it's sort of pretty hard to separate all the premierships. Mm. Um, probably the um, the first one with Darabin. Um, yep. So it, uh, Scorpions had folded uh, and uh, went across to uh, what was then Fairfield. They weren't even Darabin then. Yep. And they'd never won anything. Um, so perhaps captaining that. Um, so they called in the big guns. Called in the big guns. Yes. Of course. Uh, and I think also with that particular game, it was that the uh, infamous uh, Albion Football Club 
because yep. we struggled to get grounds. Yep. And uh, my grandfather was there. Yeah. Oh. Uh, and as we're walking off at half time, he'd tell me to pull my socks up because he reckons I was having a, a shocker. So, um, <laughs> but uh, that, that's probably um, from a from a local perspective. Yeah. Um, playing for Victoria is always special. Oh. Yeah. Uh, always, and and captaining Victoria as well. Um, so anytime you get to pull the big V on, uh, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, it is. I sadly have it actually tattooed on my foot hearts to hearts there with a v so i'm a proud victorian i actually got it um with a friend emily smith as um she's a, a proud western bulldogs um supporter as well and so we we actually got that just the day of the the 2013 draft um to start the inaugural hampson hardeman cup so it's a, a good tie there but you know playing football in those days We've heard from the great Debbie Lee around funny stories and all of that. Do you have any good stories that you can share? Obviously, that are, are viewer friendly and and stuff like that. And, and if Debbie Lee's involved, please, by all also, means, also share. <laughs> the great Debbie Lee uh, first came along to Scorpions when I was the captain at Scorpions, so that's where Debbie Lee started playing. Yeah, um, as a sixteen-year-old, I think she was. Right. Um, so. Uh, that's you know I've known Debbie and played with Debbie in, in club games and state games. So uh, Debbie Lee, uh, she's <laughs> well and truly rewarded with a, a life membership of the AFL because um, she took over after I handed over the presidency and and I'd grown it um, a certain amount, but and she's just taken it from there and she's a great woman and I have a great deal of respect for her. Yeah. But without the work that you'd put in, you know, prior to. The- I guess Deb taking the lead um, it wouldn't have wouldn't have been she wouldn't have been able to do it without you and it's like a trailblazer to the trailblazer. Yep, it's kind of remarkable and I'm in awe here because I never went through that pathway. I did I went through the netball pathway but not the big V and and how everyone talks so fondly about representing Victoria. Um, if it were to ever arise again, gosh, I hope that I could put it on because it seems like such an amazing honour to be able to do that. Oh, absolutely, um, and certainly as a player, and then, and then coaching as well. Um, uh, it, you really do have that um, joy and that honour. One of the most amazing coaching gigs I did was we went to Darwin for the national carnival, and uh, we had a mixture of the teams that then went over to the Tiwi Islands, and we played the Tiwi Islanders. Uh, oh, wow. And here's all these little Tiwi Islander kids running around with no shoes on and. Um, it was amazing. It was a fantastic experience. Yeah, that would have been that. That sounds incredible um, to be able to do that. But let's touch on a bit more of this of this coaching career. What what drew you to coaching, and and what were some, you know, I guess fond memories of, of coaching in, in retrospect to playing. Um, so what led to coaching was I think I you know I always knew that that's where I was going to head and. Um, after uh, my second knee reconstruction, I thought it was pretty, <laughs> pretty much time, uh, and I, I was getting a, a lot older. I didn't start playing footy till I was probably twenty nine or something like that. Yeah. Um, so I got into the coaching, uh, and uh, coached uh, Darabin, and then uh, I was lured over to Melbourne Uni. <laughs> uh, so um, very happily uh, went over because up until then Melbourne Uni. Um, had joined the competition and then left the competition and had rejoined and yep. was struggling a bit. So I um, went over there and my first year there we uh, were runners-up and yep. then we won back-to-back premierships. So they were um, even like you've got the tattoo. Yep. <laughs> yeah. You got a Melbourne Uni one? Yeah, of course. Oh, mate, I did not know this. Yeah. <laughs> this is great. So oh, the first I year we that. won, um, we um, nicknamed it Tattoo Tuesday. Tattoo Tuesday. So Tattoo nice. Tuesday. I like that. Good ring to it. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, the Sunday we played the game, the Monday was Mad Monday, yep. and then we had Tattoo Tuesday where nearly all the team got up and got tattoos. Everyone got a tattoo. Well, what, was this, what is the tattoo? At the Melbourne Uni Angel. Yeah, right. Oh, wow, that's okay. That. Yeah, it's not a bad thing. Something you could put like on your it. body, yeah. yeah. Wow, I'm Tattoo Tuesday, that could, that could be, be a thing. thing. <laughs> that could I'm be all a for thing. it. I'm not opposed wow. to it. Wow. What was your like, recipe for success? Because it's followed you in your playing career mm. as well as your coaching career. What was your little gold nugget that seemed to work? Uh, I think what works for me is um, the communication aspect of it and um, bringing people on the journey. And mm. I know the journey word gets used a lot. But talking at the beginning of the year about what you want to achieve 
Um, understanding each of your players about their strengths and weaknesses because it's no good putting somebody who can kick goals um, somewhere in, in another part of the ground. Um, so for me, it was really spending a lot of time with my players. Um, and I did that as a captain as well. Yeah. Um, who responds best to different ways of coaching. Uh, and um, But I think it's mainly the, the communication. Uh, and it's not just talking, it's listening. Mm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, if I don't, if I didn't listen to my team, if I didn't listen to my players, we didn't get the same results. Um, but and, you know, when at Melbourne Uni as well, because they'd been starved of success, there were people that were really happy to do anything that they needed to do for us to achieve that. Yeah, absolutely. May I'm, I'm inspired and in awe of sort of your playing and, and coaching. Is there a thirst to to do it more and to coach more and to to want to be more involved in that space of footy? Yes, um, when when it started to become more professional, um, it was too difficult to then balance between my work and and my sporting. But um, you know, I'm really hoping to get back into it uh, after I've um, finished my working career and yeah, and just having to go through the times when. Um, I was working shift work. I was involved in playing, coaching football, become the president. Yep. Um, you know, it was a really um, stressful time trying to fit everything into a 24-hour day. Yep. Uh, and so now I've sort of stepped back a bit, but I'd really like to come back into um, some sort of professional environment like you've got at the dogs in a volunteer capacity or similar. Mate, um, I'm, we're planning I'm going to go have a chat with Debbie Lee straight after this conversation and say, let's get Lisa Hardwin back in our, in our doors. Absolutely, mate. that would be... I've been saying to Al over this past week in preparation for this, I was like, I'd love for you to actually come and speak to our group. Um, this is almost like the formal invitation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry. But no, I think just... With, for people, because I'm sitting here, I'm learning so much of the history of women's football that I, I personally don't know because I haven't been a part of the pathways as much as you, mm. Um And there's a lot of girls like that that don't actually know the rich history of, of what you've built, what Deb's built and what so many amazing women have built and what you've done while juggling a career shift work and all of the other stresses <laughs> of being president of the league. Oh, no. And it's a remarkable that you're, you did, you've you done what you've done. And by all means, if whenever you want to come back, we'll get <laughs> on the phone. Deb, yeah, here, no. we've got an opportunity here. <laughs> um, but you've got a, a great one here, Deb. But, you know, when I was the president as well, um, we had four teams in the league and one team would fold and then another team would start up. And we just weren't getting anywhere. And I think one of the reasons was, identified that um, there were people that would come along to play but there were more experienced people and then they just drop off yeah so I, I established a second level competition so that's when we started to actually grow and, and yeah. attract more clubs and more players yeah. um, and so that was pretty much the turning point um, about how the game kept going and when we we're um, getting a bit bigger I went knocking on the door of um, AFL Victoria and said look you know, we're starting to grow. Can you give us a bit of admin support? Or, and uh, they said, uh, no, we won't help you. You will never be big enough for us to worry about. Mm. Oh, little did they know. And now we've Mate. got not just VFLW, we have AFLW. And so many local leagues around not just Victoria but the country and it's gone global. Like there's there's leagues in, in other countries and off the back of, you doing some of that incredible work, mate. You must be like just so proud. Honestly, you, you should be. You should you be should really be. proud. <laughs> I'm, of I'm what just shocked right now. <laughs> um, oh, you know, it was. I am very proud. Yeah. But it was one of those things too, where uh, you know, the, I think the more doors that got slammed in our faces, the more we were determined to to make mm. sure that we continued to do what we could to get girls playing footy because it's such a great game. Oh, absolutely. Oh, I've got goosebumps because you yeah, know, like, like it's just, just like. I'm mind blown. Bob wrote an article last year and it spoke about why um, I guess the girls' players celebrate the goals so much. And mm. he went along the lines of like, we haven't been able to do this before, now we can. Yeah. And that I loved that article. And it's every time like you kick a goal or I, myself, I'm just like, yes. I'm like staring at everyone <laughs> go and like crazy, go crazy the just for like, tw like five seconds. But it is, it's that elation and being like we're here look at us we can do this and it's off the back of the so so much hard work all the knows that you've done and 
I'm actually mm. in awe of you. Thank you so much for coming <laughs> yeah. on today. Wowie. That's my pleasure. But this isn't the end. <laughs> <laughs> We've still got more I hard know. hitting questions. Before we do go on to um, talk a bit about um, sort of your your actual career, um, I want to touch on year one. You sort of rolled around with us here at the Western Bulldogs in a in like a mentor capacity. What was that experience like for you? Because for me, having you around, I mean, it was a really tough year for us. And um, I think upon reflection of it, um, when people ask sort of, you know, what it, what it was like having you around, I was like, you were just the person that wrapped your arm around us and you made sure, you know, you're doing a great job. I know it's tough at the moment, but you should be so proud of what you're doing and what you're achieving. And it's this is just the beginning for us and I mean you're right a year later we we won a premiership and but like you were such a pivotal person um, and played such a pivotal role for us in that in that first year um, just just having you around was was amazing but yeah what was it like in from your eyes yeah thanks for that Ellie. um so from my eyes um, when I, I walked in and and saw the professionalism you know the the training staff the doctors the the um, all the the coaching team, yeah. you know, it wasn't I, I, my coaching days where there was me, and um, that was pretty much it. <laughs> um, so, and, and my role that year was very much about that, putting my, my arms around people who were injured, um, sitting there and talking to some of the girls that didn't get a game yep. about um, what they needed to do, sitting up in the coach's box at times. Uh, it, it was fantastic for me to be involved in in that professional environment uh, and to see what you girls could achieve which yep. was fantastic and um so i i got enormous amount out of that uh I, and i think um it was a really good start because a lot of you girls weren't aware of that environment as well and no. it was you know some of the the newer girls walked in and it was like um their eyes were just wide open and <laughs> not, not knowing what to expect and it was the first Absolutely. year because some of those girls as well hadn't been involved in the exhibition games no no um so but it was an amazing experience for me to be part of that that group in that in your in your first year. Yeah. Do you remember where you were when like that first game? Were you at the game? The first game that of AFLW. Uh no, that was at Icon Park. It was yes. <laughs> Couldn't get it. Yeah. Ticket anywhere. anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was sitting on my couch at home, uh, yep. watching it on on the TV. How? What was that? What did you feel in that moment? I cried. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mate, I think we all did. Yeah, it was no, just I cried. surreal. And then I came to the, the Bulldogs' first game and cried again. <laughs> <laughs> I remember rolling in actually after, um, because obviously the Friday night game was a lockout. And as I was rolling in, just the streets were packed. There was people everywhere lining up to get into the game. And this was over two hours before the game had yep. w was about to start. I called up mum and dad. I was like, you better leave now. I'm yeah. like, otherwise there is no guarantee that you guys are getting in the ground. They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, it is packed. It is so packed. And yeah, just the initial sort of burst of it all, it was it was amazing to to get that much support. And yeah. I, I reckon for someone like you and, and Debbie Lee and um, so many other incredible women that have paved the way for us, just oh, the feelings that would have been, it would have been so overwhelming and um you know, it would have been beautiful to kind of observe a bit more as to how you guys experienced it all. Yeah. Um, but, you know, one of the other, um, we talked about Debbie Lee, one of the other mo really amazing women, and, and I know you know her pretty well, Sue Alberti. Yep. Uh, and we wouldn't be where we are now if she hadn't um, come on board when we were VFLW. Yeah. Uh, and she bankrolled us for a lot of years. Yeah. Um, the cup, mm -hmm. the, the VFLW cup was named after her. And of course, she started. She was the main driving force behind the Bulldogs team, and Debbie was working at Melbourne then, and she was the driving force behind the Melbourne team, mm -hmm. and that's what started the exhibition game. So, you know, we talk about Debbie Lee, but geez, we have to talk about Sue Alberti as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's that's yeah, spot on too. There, we um, yeah, it, it, sometimes you get lost in in talking about you know the the same couple of women, and, and rightfully so. But there's there's so many other stories and people that we need to um, keep acknowledging and and sharing. Um, as as history keeps moving forward, but let's let's park footy for a moment. Just on. we'll come back. We'll circle back. We'll circle back <laughs> because we love footy. And we're round one. We're excited. We're pretty pumped, and we need to touch on that after. All right, we need to build the okay. excitement. Oh, let's, yes. let's build that. Let's the build anticipation. It. Yes, but we're going to dive force. into your career at the police force. Now, 
just take us back to when you first went in, you know, into what, what is it called? Recruiting? The police, police academy. academy. The academy. Sorry, my apologies. Um, yes. Why the police force? Um, I don't know. Because a lot of people, it's in their family. It's, it's not in my family. Yeah. Um, when I was going through school, um, I was trying to work out, you know, what I wanted to do. And I thought, well, oh, I'll join the police force. Um, wasn't that easy um, because... I left school and my parents were like, you've got to work, you've got to get a job. And at that time, if you were 18 and a boy, you could join. Yep. But girls had to be 21. Yep. So I went and worked in a bank for a few years and then reapplied. Uh, and uh, they dropped the age to 18, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm not bitter about it. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I went through the whole process. Uh, I was playing state league netball at the time, so I was pretty fit. Yep. Um and then uh, I got a letter saying that I was medically unfit to join the police force. Oh. And uh, it was like, what do you mean? And I divulged that I'd been to a doctor with a headache once and so that they deemed that it was a migraine. So then I had to go and get all these um, referrals saying it wasn't a migraine. Yeah. And I joined, uh, walked into the academy in uh, 1983, May 1983. Wow. That's uh, And there wasn't a lot of, of women uh, in 1983 in no. the police force. Uh, I didn't think I'd have a career because, you know, you didn't see senior people. So I thought, oh, you know, maybe if I go and become a detective, yep. uh, that'll be the pinnacle of my career and uh, I'll be happy. Um, but as we know, times have changed and we've yep. had a female chief commissioner now. And so there's a, it's a career for a lot of um, women now and, and especially young women. If they, if you want a great career, it's it's really a progressive career now. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I guess for, for me, I, I sort of am denied over joining the police force because it actually is in, in my family. And, and my dad would have, um, I feel like he probably would have joined just before before you. And um, um, he was one of the yeah 18 year olds that, that walked in the door and um, at the at the police academy there. So for me, as you're talking about it, I can I can imagine and picture you walking through the doors and and just taking it with, with both hands. But, yeah, tell us about sort of your role within the police force, what it is now and, and how, you got to, how you got to where you are. Um, so uh, after the academy, um, there's a two-year sort of um, training program where you get sent to police stations and a whole raft of things. Um, so I've done the general duties stuff. I did become a detective. Yep. Um, nice. But uh, unfortunately for me, uh, the the bosses there didn't think women should be in the police force and made life pretty difficult. So then I became a prosecutor. Yeah, right. Um, so I worked in the courts um, doing the uh, police briefs at court, which worked in at a really good time because that's when I really started picking up with the footy. So um, prosecuting meant that you had court hours, eight to four, Monday to Friday, which then freed up a lot for footy. So that worked <laughs> out wow, pretty well. That worked out brilliantly, <laughs> really. Um, Beauty. So then uh, I got promoted to sergeant, yeah. uh, worked in an undercover environment, um, in plain clothes. Um, my biggest job there was uh, there was a bloke called Carl Williams and his wife Roberta. They weren't that famous then, but we did a drug job and uh, got Carl and Roberta sitting there counting our $100,000 that we'd bought drugs off them. And uh, that was uh, um, Carl, and, Carl and Roberta ended up in jail. And uh, You are incredible. <laughs> Um, and as we know, Carl went on to become infamous, uh, as did Roberta. But wow. um, so uh, did you've a bit experienced life. Haven't you? <laughs> you've done everything. Uh, so then uh, was a, a sergeant for a while. Um, then uh, got a senior sergeant's job, and um, this is a sort of funny story as well. Um, I was had been interviewed for the senior sergeant's job, and I was doing my rounds and as an acting senior sergeant, went to this particular police station and the sergeant was on, said, oh, you're in for the job. And I said, yeah. And he goes, you won't get it. We've got some really good blokes here. And besides, I'll never call a skirt boss. And I went, okay. So the very first day I walked in, I said, anybody can call me Lisa, but you call me boss until the day I tell you, you can call me something else. <laughs> Far out, mate. Like, you really have been through it all and experienced it all and just I, I think the way you've challenged people as well, like you've really stood up for yourself and, and stood up for women. Um, yeah, and that was the thing, you know, there, as I was making my way through and there were other pioneer police women as well, mm. but you were taking on um, a male-dominated area and yep. uh, so, and a lot of the places that I've gone to, it's like 
what do you mean you're the boss? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, um, so I uh, uh, left uh, as a senior sergeant, became an inspector, um, uh, went to a, a couple of different... I went to Port Phillip first up, which was, you know, nightclubs and um, this mm. little race called um, the Grand Prix. Yeah, um, oh, that little one. That yeah. little one. Um, yeah. St Kilda Festival, yep. 300,000 people coming into, into St Kilda. Yeah. Um, so some really big things like that, which was just quite um, amazing. Yep. Um, and then um, I, Simon Overland was the chief commissioner and gave me a 12 month secondment to KPMG yep. to learn mm. change management uh, and project management. So yep. I just spent 12 months working at KPMG, wow. which was uh, chalk and cheese to what I did in the police force. Yeah, right. Far out. Like you know, I'm just like I'm listening and I'm I'm taking in so much at the moment, and I have no doubt people listening are just like are going to be continually wowed. Um, by the work you've done, but diversity and inclusion in in the police force is something that you really drove. Um, talk us through what you've done in that space. Yeah, so uh, um, under one of our chief commissioners, Ken Lay, um, he got very oct to do a, um, a an investigation in relation to uh, sexual harassment and bullying of women in the police force. And as a result of that, they produced a, a report that was pretty damning. And uh, they then set up um, a gender equality and inclusion mm. command itself to try and work through the um, the recommendations. So I was the acting assistant commissioner there for about uh, eight or nine months yep. uh, to get that going. And, and now it's a permanent command. And um, it, we're really starting to, to kick some goals in that space. Um, so that was that was a pretty interesting time because, you know, there was a lot of of the male dominated environment that mm-hmm. were saying that women were getting promoted because of this and um, how did I not get the job and a woman got the job and and there is still a bit of that going mm. on because for a long time the men would walk in to an interview and go the job's mine yeah uh, and so. Um, it's really good uh, that under um, Graham Ashton, the former Chief Commissioner and now Shane Patton, that the work in that space is continuing because we've still got a long way to go. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. You've really gone to tackle two, two male-dominated <laughs> industries, haven't you? And you're just powering through. Like The challenges you're talking about are so easy for people to just turn away and just go, like, too this hard. is too much. Yep. Oh, and a lot of people did. Um, yeah. But, you know, for me it's about... Um, how can Victoria Police be the best employer of choice? So uh, in addition to the gender report by Veriok, uh, whilst I was there in that area, we had one done on the LGBTIQ experiences yep. mm-hmm. of um, Victoria Police employees and um, they produced Proud, Visible, Strong uh, and with, a, once again, a whole bunch of recommendations about how we can be more inclusive uh, of LGBTIQ communities in Victoria Police Um, and for the last four years I've been the chair of our VP Pride which is our um, employee network um, trying to once again um, make Victoria Police an employer of choice uh, and make sure that we have policies in place um, to assist anybody that's LGBTIQ so we've got um, transgender policies and we've got building codes now around being inclusive so there's a whole lot of work that we've been able to do. How do you, because this is these are tough, you know, s- subjects for people to talk about, and and I remember you saying earlier that it's all about listening, and that you go about it like creating connections with people and communicating. Is that been the main driver in being able to you doing what you do in that space? Oh, absolutely. So um, the way I, I t- talked about my coaching and and playing and is the way I'm at work and as a leader, and um, if I don't listen to my people. And, and I just turn walk around and tell them what to do, they're not going to respect me and they're not going to respect the work that we're doing. Yep. So once again, when I'm in charge, I, I bring people on the journey and I make sure it's a shared journey. Yeah. Uh, and that way uh, we achieve some amazing results. Absolutely. Gosh. I just want to read something. I was having a look at an article <clears throat> online at, in the research for you and – People sort of talk about like you as a women's footballer and, and, you know, what you've done in the space of women's football, but like equally as important and what you've touched on anyway is what you've done in the police force. And you're right, it is a, a male dominated industry, but you've gone in and you've you've done incredible work in that space. But this is um, what they've written about you in the article. It's, it's two paragraphs. <clears throat> Patience and determination have been key 
uh, to Lisa's achievements, both with Victoria Police and in the world of women's football. She has been an advocate and role model for women in the workplace and in sport for over four decades. Lisa has been a champion for diversity and women's advancement at Victoria Police, a founding member of the Pride in Diversity Working Group, creator of the first divisional women's committee and mentor to young women who aspire to leadership roles. Just, and I mean, the article, like it, it goes on, but like you just, you sh- should be so proud and like you've done it in the women's football space, but like in a working environment as well mm. to to create a safe, inclusive, diverse inv- environment to mentor young women. Like you just, you, you're incredible. So I know what that article was from. Yep. Uh, it was when I was admitted to the Victorian Honour Roll of Women. Yes. Um and, and I was having a look through that. Uh, it's incredible women. Yeah. But go on. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was uh, my induction and um, that was the write-up, um, which was part of uh, of the award that I was given. And um, I was very honoured. Um, it was quite a big lunch. It was obviously pre-COVID. Uh, yep. And I was asked to be uh, the speaker on behalf of all the, the inductees. So I was able to get up and um, talk about policing and football. And um, so, yeah, it's... Very nice uh, little uh, certificate that sits in my office at work. Yeah, I bet it does. I bet it does. And you know what a what an honour for you to to be the woman selected to to speak at that event as well. I think it just it speaks volumes of um, the type of person you are and who you are and what you've done and um, continue to do. And I know that you're not done yet in that space and I know you're not done yet in the women's football space so thank you so far but pleasure oh, mate. and thank you for it in advance <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm sure though we'll be sort of in the pathway for the in advance part so when you're yes. walking back through the doors here in the, in the role we're, we're gonna have a chat to Deb afterwards yes and absolutely we are it'll be great um we're gonna continue um back with with football now um because round one we're here it's huge we're back. We're back. For five days. Five days. Four, six. Oh, I don't even know, mate. Right? It's, it's, it's uh, Saturday know. night. <laughs> Saturday <laughs> night. Whatever, whatever it is, it's Saturday night. Oh, we were in jeans Sorry, then. I know. Five sleeps. I oh, know. I'm but excited. What are we? What are we playing for? Hampson Hardeman Cup. Your That's cup. What? Your cup. Another your thing cup. that you named after you. Yes. So that was uh, that was a huge honour for Barb and myself. Yeah. So Barb. Although she's Victorian, was in Western Australia at the time and was the Western Australian president. Yep. I was the Victorian president. And um, as I said before, we'd been doing the matches against South Australia and we found out there were more teams. So Barb and I got together and uh, ran the first uh, interstate carnival. Yeah. Oh, so that's how it... Yeah. Amazing. So, um, which, uh, 1998, if my memory is correct. Yep. There it um, is. And uh, then once uh, the AFL started up the um, exhibition games, um, they rewarded Barb and myself um, by naming the cup. Just, um, yeah, incredible and rightfully so. Again, what was that like watching women play at the MCG? I mean, I I think there was some games that had been played there beforehand. I think Deb had, had played in a game. I don't know if you were somewhat involved in that, that had already been on the, on uh, the I think they gave us a run at half time one year. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there was a couple like, of those like, things like that with happened. A, like with a little league running around. <laughs> Essentially. Um, but th- there was a couple of um, uh, dabs at getting women to play. But um, the interstate carnivals, we had teams flying in from everywhere. You know, the ADF even yeah. had their own team. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then... Um, Queensland, New South Wales, like the traditional rugby states, yep. um, then got involved, and yep. um, and I think when we went up to to Darwin, it was virtually every state. Yeah, mm. um, it was. It really did take off. Yeah, uh, and uh, uh, and it was uh, obviously the start of of what we have now. Yeah, um, and then when the AFL um, announced the the exhibition games, um, we we played them for a few years and uh, then the decision was made that the, the Bulldogs and, and Melbourne would continue to play for the Cup um, yeah. as a sign of the, those two teams being um, the real progressive clubs uh, in, in getting this thing up and running as well. And how does that sit with you knowing that, like, I mean, sitting in exhibition games between two AFL clubs, 
I assume would be really special and um, you know really meaningful. But then for it to then continue into the AFLW, something that you, I had no doubt dreamed of of happening. Um, you know, you just that must be incredible to to know that you've got a cup named. Um, yeah, between. absolutely. So um, when we were doing the um, the exhibition games, and uh, I think Gil at McLaughlin had, had said, oh, you know, 2021 would be the year that we started. And then he came out at one of the exhibition games. Mm. It was at the MCG. Yeah. We're at the aftermatch function. And he just got up and said, no, nah, it's happening 2017. Yep. Uh, we're just going to make it happen. Mm. And it was like, oh, there is a real commitment here now um, from... Uh, the head honcho of the AFL, and mm. so then I knew it was going to happen. But mm. he bought it for it four years. Yeah, I know. We were all in shock when it got announced. I, I think I was. I was like, no, 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 like this is not happening yet. Like, why are you bringing it forward? But yeah, I mean, it's it's great that it's that it's here now um, with it. You know, how do you feel about our games against Melbourne? Like, do you get the real right? Like, do you start? Have you started to feel the rivalry that we feel? With Melbourne, because like I love, it's there. I love playing against mm, them. Yep. Like I, I find it such a, oh, it's a good game to play in. Yep. Um, like on the and uh, if you girls remember back to last year's game when uh, yeah, when mate. you won and we um, remember, yeah, <laughs> and then you pulled me into the the huddle for the song that <laughs> I was pumped. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, you're, you're a bit of a diehard <laughs> doggies fan. Yeah. Oh yeah, born and bred into a doggies uh, family. Grandparents, we used to come here all the time watching Footscray play. Yeah, uh, my parents. Um, so yeah, but. Um, Red, white, and blue blood runs through my veins, mm-hmm. and yep. uh, you know, and it's great to to have seen your premiership, and then to have been at the MCG in 2016 for the the men's premiership. I didn't think I'd ever see any Western Bulldogs premierships in my lifetime, so I had to wait a long time. Yep, nearly like, another one last year as well. Yeah. Also close. Yes, yeah. uh, half time, and then no. <laughs> no, halfway through the third quarter, I'm like thinking, oh, we're on here. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all did. I know. <laughs> anyway, we, we'll leave. We we'll won't dive that. into that we'll one too much. One. Um, I'm going to finish off with one more thing. Bon. Inside scoop. You got it? Inside scoop here. Um, so obviously the podcast, we're recording on Monday, um, tomorrow, Tuesday. There's a big announcement. But mm. by the time this comes out, um, it would have already been announced. But we get the inside scoop. So all you journos, we ha, we're ha, the ha. winners here. Ha, ha. Where your sources <laughs> yes. off the leash has got them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, so at the end of the year, where we plan to be standing, yes, um, and we definitely won't shy away from that. And I don't think any club should. No, we should no never means. shy away from what we're trying to do. What exactly. we're trying to win. But we want to hold up a premiership cup yes. at the end of the year. Absolutely, we do. And mm-hmm. who better to receive a premiership cup from than the AFLW Cup ambassador? Yes. And yeah, the I've, AFLW Cup ambassador is, is Bonnie Too Good. Lisa Hardman, congratulations, mate. Congratulations. That is huge again, just to add that to the resume. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah, awesome. I should actually. <laughs> yeah, pop it up on the LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, I might do that, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, so when Nicole um, Livingston contacted me, um, uh, she asked me to be the CUP ambassador because they also want to um, acknowledge the frontline workers from the last two years yeah. as mm-hmm. well as Special. somebody who has the, the football connection. So... Uh, she said it was a, an easy decision for them to make it at the AFL, and I've had to keep it a bit quiet and yes, um, keep it hush hush. Mm. Although You've still got another day of when, keeping it quiet. When the launch was filmed a couple of weeks ago, it was filmed here. Yes. So when when you see the the footage of their launch, you'll recognise the uh, the ground and the grandstand and. Maybe it's all just a good omen. Oh, yeah, well, that's what I was thinking yeah. when they asked me to come and uh, <laughs> do the filming at the with, with I say so myself. Mate, but you must be again just like you're doing great things, and and to to have that honour of having or being selected to be the AFLW Cup ambassador, I think, you know, it's a it's a special recognition for a special person. Thanks, mate. Yeah, I was. Um, uh, I don't think I've even told my parents yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they'll find out tomorrow. Um, but uh, yeah, it was. Uh, it's great recognition, uh, and you know, for me, it's also recognition of the pioneers mm. that have come yeah. before uh, AFLW and, and you know, Debbie Lee getting the um, the uh, life membership this year recognises the work that she's done, and so the more we continue to acknowledge the work that mm. um, people 
from the 80s all the way yeah. through to now <laughs> uh, have done. I think, you know, we're, that, it, it, you don't lose sight of um, how hard it was for some people and how much of a privilege it was for us to be able to let girls run around the park on a Saturday afternoon and to see now that the pathways for young girls, like now if I want to start a football club up at any of the, the suburban grounds, you have to prove that you've got girls' teams. Yep. Mm-hmm. You can't just now walk in and go, this is the boys' domain. Exactly. Um, so for for all those young girls coming through, um, knowing that they've got every the same chance as every board that wants to play footy, I think is is really a recognition of the work that we've all done. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing today because I think this is a story and stories that we need to continue to share so people get a greater understanding of of where women's football has come from and that rich history and the struggles and, the, and then the, all the great things that have also happened and it's really important what we're really passionate about is hearing these stories and getting them out there because I can speak for myself I came in as a cross coder a netballer that did, had no idea mm. and I'm learning along the process at pro, uh, along the journey and it's making me feel more and more passionate and then we can carry the baton for you to yep. you know keep striving it to where it really needs to be. So yeah. thank you so much for That's all your sharing today. Oh, pleasure. Really enjoyed being here. Yes, and I know you'll be cheering very loudly for us this week and, and the weeks to come. So. Yeah, so unfortunately I won't be here Saturday night. I'll be in Sydney um, when the seasons change from December into January. Um, but uh, I will be watching and I'll be absolutely cheering. Thank you. I appreciate your support. We appreciate your support. We appreciate your support. And thank you for coming in and sharing. Lisa Hardman, you're a legend. A legend. Thanks, girls. (laughs)